Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I don't have as much of a voice as usual, but it's so great to have you all with us on this official first Sunday in Christmas. And what better way to prepare our hearts and minds than to listen to Steve Gustafson on the organ playing this beautiful piece arranged by Fred Bach, Joy to the World. to that. Well, I am so proud of you all and of myself after yesterday <laughs> that you all are still here this morning. Before our call to worship, I want to just bring your attention to our welcome cards in the pew racks in front of you all. If any of you all are new with us today, please fill out the I'm new here welcome piano within that card and drop it in the offertory plate later on in our worship gathering. And also, speaking of the offertory plate, another thing you could drop into that, besides your financial giving, as we give back to God from all he's provided for us, is a prayer card. Do you all know that we have over 240 people in this church family who receive our prayer requests and praise sheets every Friday? So every week there are over 240 committed prayer partners, lifting up y'all's prayers and praises to the God who created the universe and created you and is able to do whatever it takes to bless you and to respond to you and to draw you to him. So please be thinking about any prayer requests or praise and we will lift them up together later on and then they'll be lifted up all week through prayer meetings, staff meetings, elders meetings, and, and so on. And now please stand for our call to worship, printed in y'all's bulletins based on Isaiah chapter 60 and Luke chap and John, Luke chapter one and John chapter one. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Nations shall come to your light. The day spring from on high has visited us. The night has the day the Lord has us. Lift up your hearts to worship the Lord, to worship the Word made flesh. And now let's continue praising Him as we sing the first Noel, verses 1, 3, and 6. to set a 
with me in praising our God. We praise you, Lord, for how you've not only created us, but how you also can make new creations out of us, changing us from the inside out for the better, from people who were aiming at nothing and hitting it every time, to people who are more concerned with building your kingdom rather than our own. Thank you for daily giving us opportunities to renew our hearts and minds in your truth. Lord, may today be one of those days in each of our lives, for we pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please have a seat as we prepare our hearts for confession. Pastor Gary, who's not with us physically, is still with us spiritually. He wrote a very convicting but not condemning prayer of confession. But before we pray this out loud together, I do want to remind us of the truth from Proverbs 28, 13, where we read, whoever conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. So join me in this prayer of confession printed in our bulletins. Another Christmas has passed, dear Father. Did it pass us by? We were so busy with comings and goings. We were so laden with gift giving and full of indulgence. Our expectations were so high. Our love and kindness so lacking. We heard the story and sang the songs, but our minds were often elsewhere. Forgive us, grant that this day Before it is too late and Christmas is gone, we may see the Christ child and know him as our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence to privately confess our sins to our Savior.
Lord, we give you these sins and even the sins about which we are not aware. We've only scratched the surface of all the times that we have fallen short of your best for us as your children in our thoughts and words and actions. And so we thank you, Lord, that these things will not be held against us as we freely accept your gift of paying the debt on behalf of us, that we may go free, free to live for you and not ourselves. So help us to do so. And we thank you for your great grace, which is greater than any of our sin, for you are the ultimate Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our special guest preacher a little later on is going to be sharing from words written by the Apostle Paul, but I love what the Apostle Peter said in regard to forgiveness. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, he put it this way. He said, all the prophets leading all the way up to the time that Christ took on human form and came to the earth in order to bring us eventually to heaven. He says, all the prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins in his name. So brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. <laughs> children kindergarten age and younger may continue their worship at Children's Church. We have our sweet teachers who will be waiting for you up front. And let's the rest of us greet one another for a couple moments.
this out of your way. All right. I believe Would you that. Like me to introduce this and just. I got a solo. <laughs> Well, well, we can never be accused of not being a friendly church. I am so thankful that we actually like to say hi to one another, and it's more than just a hi and bye. And I pray we all will have that each day going forward. We just have three quick announcements. The first, again, is to welcome any of you all who are newcomers in, to welcome you all who are old comers like me, because we're always happy to have each of you all with us in this body of believers. Nevertheless, please drop that welcome card and prayer and praise card in the offertory basket in a few moments. And speaking of the offertory, this year we have been, just as we've been doing traditionally, giving our extra gifts to the Christian Outreach Center and the Gardair Community Christian School, two wonderful life-changing ministries that give people a second chance at life through all of our faith in the author of life who conquered death. So I hope we'll all give generously to that opportunity. And finally, we will have a stay treat coming up and Pastor Garrett is going to be doing a few little intros to the stay treat over the next three Sundays in three different Sunday school classes. So. We'd love for any of you all to join us who can make it. The details are in your bulletin. And now let's pray for our offertory. Dear Lord, touch our hearts and minds that we give back to you from all you've provided for us, not motivated by guilt and obligation, but by joy and thanksgiving. And you, the greatest gift giver of all, for we pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Ushers, please come forward for the offertory. Oh, are we are all going forward. Is that what we decided? Are we all walking up for the offertory? All right, I didn't get the memo about the robe or the offertory. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna come forward to bring our tithes and offerings and prayers and praise cards to the baskets up front in the middle of the sanctuary. Thank you all. Shall we give to the Son of Mary? What shall we give to the tiny boy? Raisins and figs and walnuts and olives. These are all things that the child would enjoy. Come down from the sky to adore him. Angels from high come to rock him to sleep. Raisins, other voices in songs full of glory. While the babe slumbers so safe in their key.
take these gifts and multiply the effect of these gifts, that they would be used by you to not only sustain this church, its pastors, and its people, but to go beyond us to bring more people into your kingdom. For we pray this for your glory. Amen. And let's remain standing as Steve leads us in joy has dawned, which is not printed in our hymnals. Dawned upon the world, promise from creation, God's salvation now unfurled, hope for every nation, not with fanfares from above, not with scenes of glory. Please have a seat. And now you all get to hear from a much nicer voice than mine, out of the body of a much more handsome man than me. Let's pray for him as he delivers God's word to us. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your wonderful servant, Barry, here on earth. You've done amazing things in him and through him, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and minds, that we would receive your message today in a way that would bring transformation to our lives, encouragement to Barry's, and glory to yours. For we pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. 
Well, good morning. Yeah, it's an awesome thing to stand up here in front of you. Some of you know that uh, my family moved to Baton Rouge in 1959. That means that 60 years ago, uh, we came to this church, and I was in what was called then communicants class, and we now call it confirmation class. Uh, but I've been a, a member of this church in and out as Becky and I have moved somewhat. And it's, uh, this morning it particularly dawned on me that as I look out over this congregation, I see people that I've known for two or three years and I see people that I've known for 30 and 40 years. And uh, we come and go uh, through this church, through this sanctuary building. And it's an amazing thing to see people leave and move to other parts of the country, come back and visit. Uh, people die and go to see their Lord, and we celebrate their life. But we always come back to this place uh, together and enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit, and it's, uh, it's such a moving thing to be a part of this, of this fellowship. Um, so uh, I'm happy to be here, and I, I pray that uh, God's Word will speak to us this morning. Let's pray that He does that. Gracious God, uh, we approach Your Word uh, with awe. And uh, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher this morning, that you would show us things we've not seen before, make things more real that we know are real, and may we leave this place changed because of the life that's in your word. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Our scripture's from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Hear the word of God. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you perse persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. That's the word of the Lord. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but what has been revealed belongs to us, to our children forever, that we may obey the words of this law. Well, my wife Becky has been chair of the bereavement committee of this church for a number of years. If any of you are unfamiliar with that committee, a quick uh, coverage of what they do is when we have members of our church who die, this committee comes alongside the family of that person and they comfort them, console them, encourage them, help them practically. On the day of the memorial service or the funeral, they spend their day here making it an easy day for those people and those families and they greet the people of Baton Rouge and the members of this fellowship who come to celebrate the life of the person who has died. Unlike some ministries in our church, it's not directed toward a particular group of people, obviously, and it does not appear on our calendar when they do their work because we only have three or four days notice when we have a death and then have a service where we celebrate and encourage and help the families. I've been told by people from around Baton Rouge and more than a few that they actually look forward to coming to funerals at First Presbyterian Church. Can you imagine that? They say that there's a sense of family and hope and love and fellowship. They say they feel welcome and included. It's almost a joyful event for them. Since January of 2005, that's 14 years, we have had 126 memorial services or funerals in this church. Over the past five years, we've had 88 services. That's almost 18 every year. Since Jim Solomon joined us three and a half years ago, his pastoral care ministry has been involved in ministering to over 166 families. 61 of those were members of our church who died the other 105 were extended family and relationships that are outside of Baton Rouge or outside of the community. Some in our office have begun calling Jim the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Actually, 
those that Jim comforts and loves and prays for are experiencing the love of Christ every time that happens. When I consider the breadth and the scope of this one critical area of ministry, I have to ask the question and wonder, how do those in Baton Rouge who have no church family deal with the loss of loved ones? How does anyone deal with the loss of someone they love without a church family? Well, the event described in our scripture passage this morning is probably familiar to you. And I may not tell you anything new this morning, but I hope it freshens what you do know to be true and makes it more real to you. Scripture tells us that Saul was a devout Jew. According to the strict standards of the time, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He zealously kept the law of Moses. He was a passionate, high-ranking Jew with a knowledge of the Old Testament that was second to no one. And scripture tells us that he was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus Christ. He had persecuted them, placed many in prison, and even authorized the execution of many. He was on a mission of cleansing the world of those who would follow this supposed Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he was relentless in his work. He authorized the stoning of the apostle Stephen and stood by while his murder was carried out. He was authorized by the high priest to track down and imprison and persecute the followers of Christ into Damascus. And it's on the road to Damascus that we find Saul when he meets the risen Christ. Luke's words are this, these. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Luke thought this account so important that he records it two more times in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 22, when he was confronted by a mob that was out to kill him, Paul says this, according to Luke, as I was on my way to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And then again in chapter 26 of Acts, when, when Paul was making his public defense before King Agrippa, Luke records Paul's words as this, these. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? If you pay close attention, you'll see that there's something quite curious in this passage. What is so curious and what I find so interesting is that Jesus personalized Paul's persecution. Jesus personalized Paul's persecution. He did not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my disciples? even though that is what Saul was doing. And he didn't say, Saul, why are you putting my disciples in jail? But that's exactly what Saul was doing. And yet Saul, in doing this, was persecuting the disciples of Christ. He wasn't persecuting Christ. And yet Christ said, Paul, you are persecuting me. Was he speaking figuratively? Had Jesus just taken this kind of thing so personally? Did he identify so much with it that those being persecuted, he took their suffering as a personal affront and that he characterized it in this way? Did Jesus intend to imply that his followers were so wholly devoted to him that it was as if Saul was persecuting him? Or is Jesus describing reality? Was Jesus saying that every flog of the whip, every day in prison, every stone thrown with the intent to kill was actually and in reality 
directed toward him. God has revealed himself so many ways to us in his creation. Scripture says that the heavens declare the handiwork of God. We can look around us and learn much about the character of the God who created us. In preparing for this morning, I found a passage in the book of Job that just leads us into great places. Job's uh, friend, friend Zophar, uh, was chastising Job for his continued faith in the living God. And Job, as if to say, do you want to know about my God? And he says this, ask the beasts and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. The bushes of the earth will declare to you there is a living God and will tell you much about him. So after reading that verse, I became fascinated with aspen trees. If you go skiing, you've been to Colorado or Utah, and you know that those states are full of aspen trees. Most trees and plants generally reproduce through spores and seeds. In the Western United States, however, the aspen trees reproduce new trees from suckers from the roots that they send out. The type of growth explains why oftentimes we'll see thick clumps of aspen trees together at the foot of a forest or on a rocky mountain range even. A stand or a group of aspen trees is considered by botanists as a singular organism with the main life source out of sight, underground, in this extensive root system. Before a single aspen tree appears above the surface, the root system may lie dormant for years until the, until the uh, weather is correct and the sunlight is proper. Each tree is a genetic replicate of the other. Thus, they're sometimes referred to as clones of aspen trees. They're all very much alike. They share the same life source through the root system. They are connected, but appear to be just individual trees, much as a pine forest or an oak grove. In Utah's Fish Lake National Forest, one of the, one of the group of aspen trees, and it's called pando, may be the largest single organism in the world. Although it has begun a natural decline, in 1976, over 40 years ago, science estimated, scientists estimated that this pando consisted of 47,000 trees interconnected below the surface through an interconnected joined root system. They estimated that these trees weighed 7,000 tons. They were over 80,000 years old, according to these scientists and they took up over 106 acres. Now that's a tree. And consider this, in the fall, the leaves on these trees turn a brilliant yellow or golden color. A hillside or a slope will look so dramatically colored because all the trees are connected by way of their root system and get this, all the trees turn color and drop at the same time because they are one organism. It's as if they had one mind, a unified purpose, because they had shared the same life source and they were joined together by their common life-giving and sustaining root system. Paul tells us that in the church, if one member suffers, we all suffer together. If one member's honored, we all rejoice together. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When Saul was persecuting Jesus' disciples. Why? Because all believers, all individual believers in Christ, followers of Christ, are literally part of one organism joined together by the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. As followers of Christ, as those who are transformed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we share the same life source, which is Christ in us. Saul understood this. Saul experienced this. 
The life change in him was so dramatic that he would understand himself to be a new creation, one who was born again, one who was raised from the dead and called into new life in Jesus Christ. Paul could say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. His life had become new, so new in fact that Paul, Saul changed his name to Paul. And listen to the letters that Paul wrote to the churches. His, church to the, to his letter to the church at Rome, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. To the, to the church at Colossae, he said, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. To the letter, to Christi, uh, letter to the church at Corinth, he said, how ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. To the church at Colossae, again, he said, and he, Christ, is the head of the church and the body. To the letter, at the letter of the church at Ephesus, he said, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And then finally, Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. We are the body of Christ. Paul's understanding of the church, the body of Christ, began on the road to Damascus when Christ said to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Paul understood that Jesus was not saying this figuratively. He was stating reality. And it's a reality that is when one comes to Christ as Lord and Savior, he becomes, in reality, a member of the body of Christ. Not a member in the sense as a member of the city club or the rotary club, but a member in the sense that he or she is part of the body of Christ on earth. Collectively, physically and spiritually, believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Christ's spirit, Christ in us, we in Christ. It's the very essence of the Christian faith. Paul saw clearly that he was persecuting Christ. Listen again to his words in his letter to the Colossians. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You are the body of Christ, the church. All the members of the body of Christ share the same life source, the Holy Spirit. All the members of the body of Christ are literally interconnected by Christ in us. All the members of the body of Christ in that sense are one organism, the body of Christ. When the leaves fall, when one member suffers, all members suffer with them. And Paul says that this is the church the physical presence of the body of Christ on this planet through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in all true believers. And the church is not Presbyterian. It's not Baptist. The church is not Roman Catholic or Episcopalian. The church is not Methodist or Mennonite. The church is not Church of the Brethren or Pentecostal. It is the invisible church it is made up of all those whose life-sustaining power is within and it's unseen. It's beneath the surface, if you will. And our spiritual genetics are the same. We share the same spiritual DNA. <clears throat> the night before he died, Christ prayed, Father, I pray that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When members of the invisible church, the body of Christ, live like Christ, when we live as those indwelled by Christ through his Holy Spirit, we literally become Christ to the world. 
We are his hands, we are his feet, doing the work of love and redemption, grace and compassion, forgiveness and encouragement. Each of us are especially gifted in our own way from the Holy Spirit to proclaim God's truth through the world by word and by action. We show mercy and give encouragement. We teach God's word. We give generously. We show mercy and give encouragement. We teach God's word and bring wisdom to bear in difficult situations. We provide leadership and direction. We pray for one another. Working together as Christ's body on this planet, we declare to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When our bereavement teams meet to welcome those who come with the love of Christ, they welcome them with the love of Christ. We are Christ to those who come. When those in Sunday school classes reach out and bring meals and encourage and be with those who have lost loved ones, they are the body of Christ working out and displaying a healthy living body in this place. When we go into the world through the Christian Outreach Center, we are Christ to those men and women who are trying to forge a new life in this world. When we go to Gardier Community Christian School and we work with those children and those families, we are Christ to those people. When we encourage one another, when we weep and mourn together, when we share in joy of others coming to Christ, and when we pray for and with each other, we are the body of Christ, living out the life of Christ as he intended. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Because his followers were the body of Christ then, and you are the church, the body of Christ, and members of it today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, for those who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, may we leave this sanctuary today in full confidence that we are in Christ and he is in us. And Father, for those who have never received Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray that your life-giving Holy Spirit would draw them into new life in the body of Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray some more before Barry comes back to conclude our gathering and more songs of joy to our Savior. So please bow your all's heads with me. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much that you are at work in us and through us, that your church is universal. It's not contained in one building or one body, but it is all over this earth and we pray Lord that more and more people of every congregation that calls itself Christian will be so not only in name but in spirit as we surrender to you Lord as our savior and as our leader Lord we lift up anyone in this sanctuary with us today who hasn't taken that first baby step yet of simply saying that you are God that we are not, and you've created us, and you have a plan for us. Any girl or boy, any woman or man in the sanctuary today who doesn't know you, Lord, needs you. And if they are listening to me as we all speak to you, would you just lead them in their hearts and minds to say to you even now, dear Lord Jesus, I am not perfect, I need the one who is. I am a sinner in need of the Savior, and I accept your death on the cross in payment for the penalties that I should have paid. Lord, I thank you so much for 
washing away all of my sin from your sight, that I may rely on your performance and not my own, that I may become the person you've created me to be, seeking your will rather than anyone else's and your plans for the rest of my life on this earth, that I may enjoy the rest of eternity with you in that place of no more sickness, sadness, suffering, or sorrow. Thanks to you, our Savior. Lord, we lift up those who continue to live for you on this earth, but perhaps with some distractions, we especially lift up those who are hospitalized right now, that while they're off their feet, you would draw them closer into your arms. In particular, Lord, bless dear Marshall and Bourgeois. Lord, we pray that you would remove any anxiety from her heart and replace it with your peace, knowing her life is in your hands. Continue to heal Ryan Hartsley, Dala and Ray Hartley's son out in Lafayette. Lord, you are the great physician through whom all things are possible, so continue to give his earthly physicians wisdom from above that he can continue to heal beyond what they've already imagined. We also lift up Susan McCarter's family, Lord, as they trust in you, their father in heaven, regarding the status of Roger Doherty, her father on earth. Lord, we pray that if you'd be glorified through it and more people would be blessed by it, that you'd keep Roger here on earth longer. And we lift up Rick Nackvi's mom, Lord, um, Joshua's grandma, Miss Nusrat Nakvi, that she would be so aware of your presence in her life that she'd be filled with your peace in her heart, Lord, that you wouldn't take her from this world without having the assurance that she will be with all of us in the next. Lord, we lift up those who have written cards today. We thank you for Tim and his concern for Lauren's uncle, John. Lord, please continue to heal John and use this situation to draw that whole family even closer to one another and most of all closer to you. Lord, we lift up this sibling Christ who wants to start reading your word. It's so much better than man's word. It's filled with timeless truths. And so be with this person in the discipline of quiet times and Bible study and meditation and prayer that they may have more of your joy in their life. Thank you for this dear younger brother who is so consistent in praying for everyone in his family and all of his friends. Lord, we're just so thankful that when we pray, we're not speaking to thin air. You are here listening. And the prayers of your children, especially when they are truly childlike, not childish, are blessings to you, our Father. Lord, we lift up Lindsay's sister and brother-in-law as he was recently diagnosed with incurable aphasia. Well, Lord, sometimes the world tells us something's incurable and you show us otherwise. We ask that perhaps you would do that, Lord, unless somehow bringing him home would be more glorifying to you and a blessing to him, I know his family would miss him, but we just ask for your grace in that situation. Lord, we lift up Michelle and her concerns for her family, Lord, that you would intervene in every detail mentioned on this card. Thank you for Rich, Lord, and we pray for his coworker going through a divorce, Lord. We know sometimes, um, Divorce is even worse than losing someone to death. Um, the spouse remaining may wish they were dead. But yeah, you can bring life out of the situation by bringing forgiveness where it's needed and repentance where it's needed and perhaps even reconciliation, that you would be glorified through that and they would be healed in that. So do your thing, Lord. Lord, we also ask for continued healing for Benjamin Velasquez. Thank you, Lord, that he's going through physical therapy, that he's out of ICU. 
He's made it longer than his family imagines he would, and we know that's because of your answers to all of our prayers. And so we thank you, Lord. And Lord, we know there are some others that can't be spoken out loud, but you know every detail, attend to them, Lord. And in all these things, Lord, help us to get our eyes off ourselves and to keep our eyes on our Savior, that we care more about building your kingdom than our own, even as we pray the words together that you have taught all of your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Barry, come on up and take it away. Yeah, but so when I met my wife for the first time, Lois, she introduced me to Coleridge Church in Iowa. And the community in Iowa would gather in this old church that was built around, I'd say, 1885 or so. And they would get together and they would sing together hymns. And they would start about 6 o'clock and they would end around 11. So I figured, even though it's after the hour, we can sing until our hearts are content and our voices are uh, shot. Yes, he says it. So I'm going to entertain a number anywhere between, uh, what's the numbers here? Let's see. 125 and then 166. Any of the Christmas carols that you find in your hymnal, we'll sing one or two verses and we'll keep singing until Barry tells me to stop. What, what number? 131. So everybody grab a hymnal. Angels from the realm of glory, let's sing verses one and four. Some of you are already looking ahead. Another number? The hand in the back. 133. 133. Verses 1 and 3. Hark the Join the triumph of the 
Another hand. 166 and we, we, is that right? 166 and one, and we three kings. Those are the next two that we'll, we'll sing. All right. 166 is we three kings. Cool. Right, let's do verses one and five. of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse so far field and mountain moor and mountain following yonder star oh, star of wonder star of night star with royal beauty balcony. One twenty-eight. All right. Verses one and four. Forty-five, and I have received notice from the boss over here that this is probably going to be our last one. So let's sing all three verses of O Come All Ye Faithful. Steve, what number did I say? That's okay. 
because we're on one page and you're on another. I think one, one, 145, is that right? 145, great. I do like that too. Now may the love of God the Father, peace of Christ the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes you one body of Christ in this place bless you and keep you as you leave and go. May he remind you who you are in Jesus Christ. And those who are members of the body of Christ replied saying, Blessed be the Lord I am, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.